Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Abram was his name. Sarai was his wife. And together God commanded them to go on a journey to a land where they would settle and raise a family. But they were well, both, pa both well past childbearing age. The writer of Genesis informs us that Abram was 75 years old, and likely Sarai was about 10 years younger than he. So how could there be a family from this old man and this old woman? Nevertheless, six chapters and 25 years later, their names were changed by God to Abraham and Sarah. And three men visited them, one of them, God in disguise, in human form. And these three men deliver to Abraham and Sarah the message that Sarah will become pregnant. And she laughs at the news. But in the natural course of time, she does deliver a son. And they name him Isaac, son of laughter. They're trusting in God's promises. Their obedience to God's commands carried them through the journey, the settling in, the acceptance of their new names, the welcoming of the strangers who confirm for them they will be building a family. That's just as God promised. But before all of this can happen, they had to relinquish their hold on what had been, their home, their family and friends, all that was familiar to them, in order to go out in faith, to embrace what was new and unfamiliar and unknown, and yet was beckoning to them so strongly that it could not be ignored. Go, God said. This change of direction in their lives necessitated that they let go of their self-directed life, their course in life, and trusting in their new God-directed course of life. And as they did that, they were blessed. And then they offered those blessings to those around us, around them. Nicodemus was his name, a Pharisee a member of the powerful Sanhedrin at the temple in Jerusalem. He used the cover of darkness to approach Jesus secretly and ask him questions, questions that had been plaguing him, but also intriguing him, questions of a spiritual nature that none of the Jewish law code would cover. And Nicodemus had heard that Jesus was the only one who could answer his questions. And so he came to him at night. But each time he asked a question, Jesus answered, and Nicodemus ended up asking another question. How can anyone be born after they've grown old? Well, he obviously admired Jesus from a distance, calling him rabbi, teacher. Said he had heard about the miracles that Jesus had done, and he wanted to understand what Jesus' relationship was with God. How could he, Jesus, a human being, do what he was doing unless it was of God? How did that work? He has this sincere desire to learn, so he listens very carefully to Jesus' answers to his questions. That no one can enter heaven unless they're born from above that you must be born of water and the Spirit, hmm. that the wind blows wherever it wants to, and by listening to it, you can't figure out where it came from and where it's going, hmm. that the only one going up to heaven is the Son of Man who came down from heaven, hmm. and he will be lifted up, and those who believe in him will have eternal life. And the reason God sent him into the world was to save the world. 
No wonder Nicodemus, taken aback by all of these answers, says, how can this be? If he had anything more to ask Jesus, it's not recorded in the Bible. But we don't hear about him again until Good Friday, when he and Joseph of Arimathea came to claim Jesus' body after it had been lowered from the cross. And Nicodemus brought spices, embalming spices, to prepare the body for burial. Did Nicodemus finally throw off that veil of secrecy that he had been hiding behind and become one of Jesus' disciples? When he met Jesus, all of a sudden, his life's self-directed course got changed to becoming a God-directed course. The Gospel writer John doesn't tell us what happened to Nicodemus after Jesus' death and resurrection, but I have this notion that his secrets exposed to the Pharisees and his loyalties obvious to the disciples. He joined a different family of faith than the one he was first identified with. He found a place among Jesus' followers where it was safe to ask questions, where he discovered that, that some of the disciples were asking the same questions he was. And together, they were helping one another to find the answers that plagued them, that intrigued them, that would not let them go or be ignored. And so God blessed Nicodemus, and he became a blessing to others. Two families from our scripture lessons this morning, and one more, ours. Bethlehem also has a story to tell. We ask questions. We seek answers. There are many of us and our stories to tell. A collection of stories of the folks who are gathered here this morning in worship. And the stories of those who are listening this morning over the radio broadcast. And the stories of our snowbirds returning home soon with the spring. And the stories of past generations of Bethlehem members since 1872 when we began worshiping together as our Savior's Lutheran Church, and stories of future generations being added to this faith community. It's an incredible calling to build up our family. It's a work in progress, as Martin Luther described the congregation that he served. This life is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. This not, life is not health, but it's getting well. This life is not being, but becoming. This life is not one of rest, but of exercise. We do not know what we shall be, but we are on the way to being. The process is not yet finished, but it's actively going on. This is not the goal, but it, we're on the right road. At present, everything does not gleam or sparkle, but everything is being cleansed. Martin Luther. During the season of Lent, we continue this process of building our family on the foundation stones of the words that Jesus spoke to his newest disciple, Nicodemus. The words that God spoke to his beloved, Abraham and Sarah. Words of hope for the future. Words of promise fulfilled. Say them with me. You know them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In Jesus' name, amen.